Welcome to the AFBE Leadership Talk program, where we aim to inspire effective leadership and promote diversity in corporate leadership level. I am your host, Dr. Roy Beatrice, and with me is our special guest, Ifai Nwabobo. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our AFBE Leadership Talk program. It has been an exciting week and month that we have been through, and now we are in November with a very special guest. Um, but first, I would like to say welcome. If this is your first time joining an AFBE Leadership Talk program, um, I would like you to visit our webpage and find out about leadership programs and all the exciting programs that uh, we offer in AFBE from transition to next generation real projects. Um, and recently, the Engineering Ethnicity Index, which has been launched by AFBE. I would save that for the last, and we will talk a little bit about it um, just towards the end of this talk program. Um, with me, I have my leadership team, um, Bumi, and also um, Professor Eddie Whiffer as well, who's a subject expert um, in this particular topic that we are um, hosting this very special guest today. So thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce our very special guest, um, Mr. Ifai Nwabogo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. That's right. Thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Um, Ifai is the Vice President, Reservoir Performance Division um, for SLB. Um, I hope you all know that Slombeje has rebranded and is now known as SLB. So from now on, SLB is, is the future of, of Slombeje. Um, he has worked in several countries around the world, several, um, and, and it will be exciting to see and hear from him. Um, he's married, he's a family man, and um, he's a very pleasant person to speak with. I say that from experience because I have been dealing with him for the past few weeks, and it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, if I, thank you very much, and welcome to the AB Leadership Talk program. Awesome, awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Roy, and thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to join you uh, today uh, for this talk. Uh, I consider that uh, any time we get together to speak about topical matters in industry, it's a privilege. Uh, and in addition... Sorry, to... if, I, if I may interrupt, can you switch on your video? Because we can't see you. Uh, my video is actually on this number. Um, I can. I can see him. I can now see him. Okay. okay. Yes, now I can see you. Yes, welcome. Okay. Very good. All right. So thanks, Roy, and thanks to AFB for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to join you all, particularly to join uh, a topical uh, invitation. I see some uh, familiar faces uh, on the line. Hassan, how are you doing? You gave a thumbs up just now. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of other people uh, either participating with us this evening or joining the conversation by reviewing the, the recording. Without much ado, I will introduce myself in, in a lot more detail. I'm gonna share my screen for us to you know, kick off the conversation. Uh, I have a few uh, slides more as a leader uh, to help us have a proper conversation. And this evening, I'm gonna be speaking from London, from my office in London actually, uh, on our energy future leadership, in a global, in a changing global energy landscape. Um, it's a topical issue, like I mentioned, because uh, times are changing. Um, we've all heard about the energy transition. And like Roy mentioned, indeed, uh, Slumberge has uh, transitioned and changed its identity uh, into SLB. So I like to say that I used to work for a company called Slumberge. Uh, last week, uh, I joined. Uh, a company called SLB, which is making a huge difference for the energy transition to allow uh, a balanced planet. Um, a few statements I'm going to make on this uh, presentation are perhaps future leading or forward 
looking statement. Uh, I am not uh, speculating about any markets, just for anyone to be aware, everyone to be aware. And basically, I'm sharing opinions uh, of the nature in, in a market that is uh, with public information. Okay. So that's just a bit of a safe harbor to get some of the, uh, if you like, the due diligence comments out of the way. Um, without uh, much ado, um, myself, uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, I've worked in Sambuje for over for SLB for over 20 years. Uh, for 21 of those years, it was called Slumberge, like I mentioned. And I've been very fortunate to have worked in uh, numerous countries around the world in lots of positions. Uh, I started out as a field engineer. I took on leadership roles, project management roles, technical roles. Uh, at a point in my career, I was quite fortunate to have been the managing director for Slumberger than it was in West Africa. Uh, and right now I'm taking the leadership of reservoir performance uh, in what we call the offshore regions of the world. I have a collage of pictures at the bottom just to show how uh, diverse uh, the business units I work for are and the travel involved in terms of this regard. Um, who are we in SLB? We're a global technology company we're driving uh, innovation in the energy industry. And why are we doing it? We're doing it for a balanced planet. Um, this actually means that we have a number of areas where our focus and our concentration as an industry uh, or as a company operating in the energy industry, in the technology space are focused on and none more important than decarbonizing the industry. We've been in the energy industry, in the oil and gas space for almost a century, and our mandate continues to be to innovate in, uh, in oil and gas. And in line with the conversation we're going to have this evening, um, we're also looking at scaling new energy systems as the energy transition uh, takes place. And lastly, there is an opportunity that we're not going to be able to deliver uh, the mandate of energy for the world reducing the carbon impact of that energy without deploying smarter, more clever, and more innovative ways in the digital space of doing this. So digital at scale is very critical for this. Um, but one of the things that I think is important to highlight is why did we come to this realization and basically transition so, um, or basically change or pivot with our identity. So and really it is because of the energy transition the energy transition being the pivotal moment of our time, being the essential story right now. Um, and I think before I go into any kind of blurbs or, you know, uh, statements, I'd like us to have, you know, um, our first poll. Uh, so, um, Roy, if you would, uh, just run the poll number one. Let's see from the audience. I know there's... Not too many people just now, but maybe we'll grow as a poll continues. I was, I was, if it's okay with you, if I, I was hoping before we jump into the poll, yes. which sort of introduces um, the theme for today's topic, um, maybe we just had a little bit of, you know, chat about you because one of the aims within the leadership uh, program is mm -hmm. the. You're a highly technical and, and, of course, competent individual. But we want to know just a little bit about you first as an individual. Okay. Um, that would also give us a bit of time for um, if, if there are any um, persons who are running late to join the program. To okay, that's fine. Join. That's fine. That's fine. How many minutes do you have for me to talk about myself? I mean, we can, we can just have a few five, ten minutes just to uh, okay. talk a little so, bit about you as an individual because um, sometimes it's about, you know, unveiling the mask, unveiling um, this uh, person who has been able to achieve uh, this um, great feat within an industry um, for so long and just trying to understand a little bit more about you. Maybe if you can, no, thanks. If you can stop I, sharing I, I your will, slide, that's okay. I, I, will, I will do that. And you're right. Maybe it's better to get a bit more, you know, uh, aware with the, with, the, with the audience or with the crowd. So yes. uh, folks, uh, born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm Nigerian. Uh, I did all my education in Nigeria uh, and studied 
uh, engineering uh, in uh, the University of Benin in uh, Benin City, uh, Nigeria. Uh, I'm part of a working roots family. Uh, my dad uh, was a lawyer, my mom uh, an entrepreneur, and they instilled in us, I would say, uh, a very strong drive uh, for education, for uh, achievement, uh, for curiosity, for knowledge, uh, and studying. I remember uh, at different times, uh, my dad would call me up and just start talking about legal items or legal things. Okay, fine. I probably didn't, uh, didn't please him by going in the engineering direction and not doing law or medicine, as was the case back then. But nevertheless, uh, I like tinkering uh, and uh, my love for traveling and interacting with people really played very well uh, in terms of my career with Slumberger, which, mm. uh, like I mentioned, started in 2001. Uh, I started out as a field engineer, uh, very fortunate to have, you know, you know, left the country and traveled around dozens of countries performing jobs in the, uh, in the oil fields of Algeria, Tunisia, uh, in Europe, um, you know, interacting with people and fundamentally learning that regardless of where you come from, it's people interacting with them that makes a difference and it's connecting with them, you know, numerous stories and opportunities to learn mm. uh, in North Africa, in Saudi Arabia, and coming back. You want to ask a question? Yes, uh, uh, just curiosity. You went into engineering, studied engineering, and you have a love for traveling. And my understanding of SLB is they like to post people around the world because clearly you didn't change companies. So that meant you found yourself in a company that you love and you kept on doing what you love doing and that has spanned over the decades now far too often what people struggle with is um doing what they love to do and well finding what they love to do as well because a lot of times people are not spoiled for choices um in your case, I think it was a one, one, one target, one hit, and, and it was, a, it was a, if I may say, a smooth sailing in, in, in your own case. You know, so how would you advise people who you know, want to go into a career that they love and would want to progress you know, through the ranks and really get like as high as you did? I really like this question, Roy, and maybe the answer to the question is, I probably, you know, miscommunicated. I did spend more than 21 years working for the same uh, company. However, in those 21 years, I've had numerous roles. Mm -hmm. I was a field engineer, um, not only a field engineer in Africa, a field engineer in Europe, uh, a field engineer in the desert, a field engineer in the jungle. So there wasn't any shortage of, if you like, excitement and difference in the, in the job as it were. So certainly it was very, very interesting, whether from the technical challenge point of view or from the geographical changes that were observed. Um, but soon after, um, we have a maxim within SLB, which we say that we, we recruit where we work. And we offer borderless careers. And this maxim I've found to be true. So very soon after working as a field engineer, I took on a sales role. And basically in selling, you hone your skills in being able to read a room, in being able to you know, uh, capture emotional cues, in being able to sell to your customers' needs and, and so on. Sequel to that, I took on a line management role. Uh, where I initially had 20 people in my team and with the growth and, um, you know, opportunities that came at the time, my team grew to over 70 people. This was as far back as 2006. Um, later on, I got the opportunity to take on a project management role. First, I got trained. Then I got put in a, a, a decent-sized project, which was successful. And then I did another project, which was successful. 
and I did another project in a period of three and a half years. After that, someone said, you know what, let's give you an opportunity to work in technology. So I spent two and a half years working in our technology center in France, in Paris, working with some of the smartest engineers and technical people, physicists, mathematicians, you know, doing experiments, uh, trying to develop new technologies and bring them to market for the benefit of the oil field. After that, I went back to a line management role. This time, instead of uh, 50 or 60 people, I had about uh, 150 people in the team and we're talking significant sums of money uh, in terms of the delivery. Uh, and maybe two years after that, this is 2016, someone said, we're gonna give you the keys to be the leader uh, of uh, then Slumberjay's interest in all of West Africa. That was a huge leap, you know, to go from a line management role to that. So the point I'm making in this summary is it's one organization, it's one company, but it's numerous, numerous opportunities for development. You can hardly catch your breath with, you know, all the countries, positions, interactions uh, that I've been very fortunate to have in this period of time. It, this is amazing. Uh, now, what I sense here is two things. First of all, you changed from not just a technical role. You went into sales, you went into new tech, um, you went into project management. And, and that gave you, if I may say, a very well-rounded background um, in leading people managing projects, managing resources. So you didn't just stick with the technical side of it. That, that's one. And, and you've said twice or three times, someone said, so did you have a sponsor? Did you have a mentor? If not, how else were you identified? So you, you asked very, very good questions. Um, I'll start off by saying, uh, in, in the former in the former main where you're talking about leadership skills and developing leadership skills. I think one of the most important things that everyone on this call and everyone interacting uh, in a professional space need to realize is that we need to enter the workforce with a lot of humility and nobody knows all the answers a priori. I certainly didn't know all the answers coming into the field. I certainly didn't know all the answers getting into any of these roles. So you had to learn. We have a very rigorous training and development program. And there's also a very strong talent management system where you identify people who learn and who can apply their learning in a very particular way. Um, I can say that perhaps one of the reasons why you or someone else might consider me a success is because I've failed a lot. I've failed a lot at many things. And learning through failure, I think, is the most effective way. Now, hopefully, the consequence of your failure is not catastrophic. It's one that you can remember, uh, sorry, that you can recover from. And it's also one that you can reflect upon, you know, in your quiet moments to be able to say, this is the, you know, the step forward or the way uh, to go um, in terms of development. Now, um, you talked about someone said, um, I, we've got a very... Uh, I would say mature talent identification and uh, opportunity uh, delivery program within SLB. Uh, it's one that basically, like I mentioned to you, we recruit from where we work, we promote from within, we offer borderless careers, and we're endlessly on the hunt to identify talent and perform the introduction between these two entities talent and opportunity. Um, that's the reason why more than five decades ago, SLB in Nigeria was hiring Nigerian graduates from Nigerian universities and sending them abroad as international engineers. Mm. You know, my late father-in-law uh, was one such hire. He was a first class graduate of uh, electronics uh, engineering in UNN Nsuka and was hired straight from school and sent to Cairo. So these stories are part of our DNA, understanding, identifying, and giving opportunity. 
I know what you mean about mentorship is very important, identifying mentors and training. And in fact, we assign mentors to young engineers to help them through the technical courses. We assign mentors to young leaders to help them learn. But I would say that the most important determinant of um, <coughs> advancement and success in this regard is probably the ability to learn, the ability um, to reflect on successes and failures. And I can tell you, I've had uh, a lot of failures that I have learned from. And, you know, on the flip side, I've also had uh, a number of successes that I'm very proud of. Excellent. Before we jump into um, talk for the day, what advice would you give some of the listeners who are very technical? So, uh, and why I'm asking this question is, we, within the leadership program, we've created Transcend uh, as a leadership training program, and it's to help people progress into leadership roles. Now, having said that, what you find is um, there will be technical people who are solely focused on that technical aspect, and, you know, they become, you know, the subject matter expert for the next 15 years, and become senior or technical. Um, but it, it now feels like getting beyond that to get into a management position um, almost feels very like a daunting task for them. And in, in your case, you know, you went through a lot and, and simply because of the culture, the maxim of the organization. So you had an enabling factor and an enabling environment, which some companies don't have. Some companies do not have a borderless uh, uh, work experience for, 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 for their employees. So what advice would you give to people who just get stuck there, who just can't progress past that senior technical role? Okay, so the first thing, Roy, is let's agree that it, it's about choices, okay? It's about what does an individual want out of their career? There is absolutely nothing wrong with being a technical person. There's absolutely nothing wrong with spending your career splitting the atom into however many million you know, particles you can find. There's nothing wrong with being technical in that way. I think the first thing you have to identify is what does the individual want? And from that perspective, we can then, if you like, give guidance, counsel, on what are the things to do. I'm going to answer your question in a minute, but I just want to clarify that mindful of that, we've got an entire career path for people who want to be technical. Like I mentioned to you, uh, during the period when I worked in the technical center, I met people who spent their entire careers solving mathematical problems and problems with physics. We would not be able to understand some of the physical parameters and create solutions in industry if we did not have people with these competencies. So these, these individuals need to be encouraged to be able to perfect, hone their skills, and you know, raise their head up high in industry as they're con as contributing. Now, we will also, we will therefore have some people who are very technical. We'll have some people who are generalists, some people who have some technical skills, some sales skills, some other functional skills, and can be widely general. And these individuals are also needed, but let's not create the narrative that, you know, being in management is the only, if you like, direction for success in a career. Now, to answer your question, if an individual um, desires or wants to be able to break out of a technical mode and expand, then um, I have a mnemonic, which I call BRICS, B R I. CKS. It's like building bricks for uh, a house or building bricks for a structure. And it's a mnemonic that says, you know, you need to use this as a, a route map to be able to find your narrative. It's very important that first we have to have that desire, that individual who uh, says, this is the direction I want to go and then bricks. The first thing is you need to, and I'm going to do this quickly because I could talk about this for, for a long time. Yeah. Is B, B is for building and earning trust. You need to build and earn trust. So if you're a technical person, 
there has to be quality in what you do. There has to be trust in what you say. You know, if you perform an experiment, you know, that experiment needs to be, you know, foolproof with regards to the results, the reporting and the output. Um, R is for risk management. I consider that in every single job, regardless of what you do, we're all risk managers. The key question is, what is the quantum of risk? Is it financial? Is it reputational? Is it health? Is it uh, you know business risk? Is it are you going to get a contract? Is it IT? Uh, is it cybersecurity? We're all risk managers. So I think that in terms of risk for your career, the individual needs to take responsibility and own that. It's not a question of they said, he said, she said, somebody doesn't want me to advance. You need to own that. I in BRICS is for integrity. Integrity is non-negotiable. And working in different parts of the world where there's different reporting practices and different, um, if you like, cultural norms, it's important that integrity is key. Uh, for the individual who's technical, who wants to go into a leadership role, C is for curiosity. You have to be curious. You know, very often we come into situations acting like we know it all. Yes, you're the professor in whatever technical field, but, you know, we need humility to learn. And um, I think it's important for us to adopt that mindset uh, in, you know, in any field. So, for example, the technical mind will need to gather soft skills, will need to engage with different groups of people and understand, you know, how to read a room and all the other basic, if you like, things that we take for granted, uh, but are not ne necessarily uh, knowledgeable. Two more letters. K is probably the one I, you know, like to uh, invest the most time. It's know your gaps. Know your gaps. And you walk into a room, know what you know, know what you don't know, and perhaps more importantly, know who knows. So you can go sit down next to them and say, teach me, explain to me, help me out in this situation. Success is no longer a one person story. And the last one, S, is set ambitious goals. So BRICS for me is, uh, is a mnemonic. Uh, it's really... Uh, powerful tool for me and I think we can go into the details of how technical people can move on and you know we can get you know at career advancement uh, but I do think we need to have a continue this conversation because we're probably halfway into this. Indeed um, so let's let's jump into it this this has been very exciting and thank you if I think we've we've um, gained something enormous with this BRICS um, strategy here, which um, Oli has so graciously posted in the chat group. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a good way forward. Uh, I, I love this as well. And thank you for sharing. Um, awesome. So we can jump into the, uh, into the poll. If you share okay. your slides um, and um, the audience, please, I would like each and every one of us to participate as much as possible. It's a poll that is shared here on Zoom app. So it should be fairly easy for you to just answer um, the questions and we can see what the majority of people think. Um, so it's okay, I would share poll one now. Um, uh, somebody else has logged in. Um, Oli, did you log in? If you did, I, I can't. I can see poll one. Can you see it? Okay. So Paul one says, what is, I can see one, it. what is the number one component of the global energy mix by type today, 2022? So, okay. There's 15 people on the call. If we have, you know, 10, 12 responses, then maybe we publish. Um, yep. Uh, so, uh, Oli, if you can see the results, can you do it? Because I think somebody logged in and has logged me out. Okay. Uh, oh no, I can, I can, I can see it. Um, uh, so, 
uh, just to go back to the poll. Um, so 89% said oil and gas. Perfect. Uh, no, no one said coal, nuclear, biomass, uh, but about 11% say renewables. Okay, very good. So let's launch poll two. This just gives me an idea of who the audience is. So poll two. Um, Ollie, can you launch poll two? I'm, I'm still. Uh, that, 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 that's what you're testing my Zoom knowledge now. Um, no. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Because I got oh, yeah, down, we're, so, yeah, 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 we're 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 in poll two, which says what is the projected number one component of the global energy mix by energy type, twenty fifty. So that's what poll two says. C can you launch it? Has it been um, launched? it's 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 on already. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's, it's on already. Uh, people are responding already. It's growing. So the projected number one component of the global energy mix by energy type. But yeah, so uh, uh, it, it looks like we've got a good response here. So I, I'll just report that to you. Uh, so 80% say renewables, 20% say oil and gas. So complete okay. opposite. <laughs> that's, that, that's very interesting that uh, most people say renewables. We're going to look, we're going to see the, the answers shortly. And poll three, to round up this session of polls so we can basically get through the discussion. Okay, uh, let's see. Yep, yeah, so uh, it's on. It says the energy transition is about, one, no more use of hydrocarbons on the planet, two, cleaner energy sources and the use of more renewables to minimize global warming, Three, less energy intensity consumption and more energy conservation. Four, allowing everyone to make their own choices in selecting energy sources. And five, more gas as a transition fuel. Okay. So the responses are a little more split here, just a bit more. Uh, no, actually, it looks like two choices. Do you want me to read out the result? Yes. No, it's still, some people are still voting, so I'll give it one more. Okay, right. So the results are 88% uh, say cleaner energy sources and the use of more renewables to minimize global warming. And 11% says less energy uh, intensity consumption and more energy conservation. Awesome. Awesome. So it looks like cleaner energy sources and the use of more renewables is, uh, is taking the lead. Um, however, the reality is that um, the energy transition is really about a, a lot of things. So let me just go through the material and hopefully we can have some time to, to have a discussion at the end, right? Okay. So um, the energy transition is actually not new we've had series of energy transitions through history um, and actually as far back as time itself. But this chart is showing uh, an energy transition if, from 1800. Um, and you know, the one thing about the energy transition and you can see is each energy transition, there perhaps three, three takeaways. Each energy transition is characterized by it changed from one dominant form of energy. So for example, in this case, we had wood and biomass in the 1800s and transitioning to coal. But you never have an elimination of the underlying form of energy. So you've transitioned from wood and biomass to coal you've transitioned from coal to oil, you've gone from oil to added gas, then you've added nuclear and others, but most of the existing forms of energy actually continue, which is why the first two questions about what's the dominant form today versus the dominant form tomorrow uh, in the 2050 would be. I'm going to just shift to a very interesting um, cartoon that I found 
uh, and Roy, help me if you can see this here. I found yes, this on we, our, we can our see world it. data, and it's going from 1800. And basically, I'm going to move very slowly just to navigate in 10 year increments how traditional biomass and wood gave way to increasingly more coal. In, in the mid 1800, oil was discovered, but it didn't gain wide usage. And the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s saw coal being used to power steam engines and trains and transportation. And then oil started making a little bit of an inroad. And then in the late 1800s and early 1900s, oil just took off with the invention of the motor cars we know it today. And you can just see how coal, even though it's been around since the mid 1800s, has actually continued growing its share through the 1900s. Oil and gas started, you know, and if you like, uh, exponential increase, and other forms of energy, hydroelectric, nuclear, have also increased. So I'll just go, I'll do this again, just for you to see how the energy transitions have evolved over time. I'll go back to 1800. And you can find this in ourworldindata.org. It's a really useful chart to describe how the energy transition has evolved over time. And from my perspective, it's probably the best, you know, the best way to view these transitions uh, in time. Okay. Yep. Um, if I go back to my slides. Um, the actual answer to the second question, the first question was correct, obviously, but the actual answer to the second question regarding the, um, regarding which energy, trans energy form will be number one by 2050, uh, from most sources, it's actually projected to still be oil and gas. Now, if you look on this table on the right, here in, 20, in the early 2020s, uh, hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and coal constitute about 78, 80% of the uh, energy mix today. Uh, by 2040, 2050, that's going to reduce with the biggest impact being on coal, even though it doesn't look like it with the recent energy uh, challenges we have, um, uh, you know, uh, that we've seen in, in Europe in particular with the energy crunch. Uh, but there's going to be an almost exponential increase in the use of um, renewables from you know, current 2-3% today to what is considered to be at least 15%. It could be higher given the fact that this is an exponential increase. But the point is oil and gas as an energy source will still be relevant for several years to come in the future. And this is important to keep in mind uh, because that's going to govern our attitudes towards how we solve problems. Okay, so maybe just a quick one. Let's launch poll four and five. So poll four, please, sorry. Poll four. Uh, just give me, I think maybe we should just give me a second because I've lost <laughs> entirely the control well, to poll. Right it's launched right now, poll four. Is it launched? Okay, that's fine. Which so. of following is the most energy issue today? Is it the energy transition? Is it energy security? Is it energy poverty, that is reducing energy poverty, or energy balance? So. Are we getting responses in? Uh, Bumi, did you launch the poll? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Can you read out the responses, please? Yeah, okay, just on. Um, so, um, which of the following do you think is the most important energy issue today? So, we've got 60% um, says energy security and 30% energy poverty, 10% energy balance. Oh, interesting. Very interesting uh, result. And then the last one is a yes or no question. If we could get that out of the way, and I'll try to wrap up the discussion in, in five minutes. Call five, please.
Um, is the wall doing enough to decarbonize and transition from fossil fuels to renewables? I, I don't see it. Has anyone launched it? Okay. Um, see yes, it. can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it now. Right, so it says, is the wall doing enough to decarbonize and transition from fossil fuels to renewables and cleaner energy sources in line with COP26 targets? Um, I'll just wait a bit to just see responses. Right, so we have 89% says no, 11% says yes. Okay, so very good. No, thank you, Bumi. Um, so basically, uh, I, I really like these, these discussions because the first poll discussing energy uh, issue, um, transition, the energy transition speaks to uh, the discussion we already have about the energy mix. Uh, energy security is about nations populations, people demanding energy as the population is increasing. Uh, and frankly, uh, energy poverty is a real issue in the world where we've got a significant population of the planet not having access to electricity, not having access to the basic uh, things that we enjoy uh, in, in, you know, most of us on this, uh, call enjoy. So the fact that most of the world in Africa or in some parts of Asia and Latin America don't have access to electricity is an issue and we need to consider that. So I would say that the real solution or the real issue is energy balance. The transition is important because we need to keep um, the, you know, the temperature rise to the planet to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, and that really is what is driving the carbon budget curve, which you will find in SLB's logo. Um, energy security is important because you can see uh, geopolitics, you can see nations trying to secure energy supplies as a matter of importance. So energy security is important. But in addition, energy poverty is also an issue for the world. And frankly, we need to consider all three because um, they are in balance. If we stop one form of energy today, then you're going to put millions of people out of having access to power. If we prioritize uh, energy poverty or um, energy security to the detriment of the planet, then you're going to have even worse impacts of global warming. So the issue uh, for today is we are challenged with a great balancing act to be able to provide energy to the world, to do it responsibly by decarbonizing, and also to provide access to power for most of the planet. And that was represented in our logo with the carbon budget curve. You see that on the left and the increase in energy to meet demand, but the decrease in carbon to rationalize and save the planet. So it is a balance. The last slide for me is basically, uh, hopefully to help a discussion in 15 minutes. Uh, I hope the data from the IEA uh, and all uh, sources suggest that oil and gas or hydrocarbons will continue to be relevant as a source of energy on the planet. Um, it is needed to be able to balance the needs of energy security, um, but we aggressively need to decarbonize and move to cleaner sources of energy so that we can minimize the human impact on the planet, particularly with temperature rise. Um, there's a historic opportunity to use investment uh, and allow people to be able to have access to energy as cheaply as possible. Um, as professionals and as leaders, we need to educate ourselves on these topics. We need to advocate uh, for a balanced transition that allows access to energy, but simultaneously responsibility for the planet. And I already talked about BRICS. Uh, leaders have to be diligent, resourceful, curious, and um, multidisciplinary in their engagement to be able to uh, tap into success. So Roy, I'm gonna hand over to you and then we'll see if we can have a brief discussion uh, in the time that we have left. 
Indeed, thank you very much, Ifaing. Um, So while we're taking questions, I would like us to go back, if you can put back your slides, the, 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 you know the moving slide that you had um, that showed the different energy um, forms. That's a very interesting slide. Uh, and it's something that, you know, has got me thinking, and I'm, I'm pretty sure some of the viewers as well. Um, there's something you said, you know, biomass, which was, you know, the previous energy form, wasn't totally phased out. Coal has been reduced, not totally phased out. The same thing with oil. We now have natural gas, nuclear, hydropower, all the forms of renewable energy as well that are coming into the mix. Um, and the aim is so that we protect the planet um, from not increasing by, you know, the two degrees or um, 1.5 degrees. 1 1.5 increase um, that will lead to global warming and, you know, change in, 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 in the, well, our, our environment and the climate as well that would have an impact um, on basically the weather and everything around us. Now, if all these previous forms haven't really been phased out, and there's an argument that says um, the mining, the exploration of oil is what has seriously led to the increase um, in the past, and it's not going to be phased out, then what's the way forward? Because if it's not totally phased out, we're increasing other forms of renewable energy. Um, what will happen in the next few decades? So uh, I'm going to be very quick on this one, uh, Roy. Phasing out sources of energy is not the target of you know, the energy transition. It's about fu fundamentally minimizing the carbon. And it's the emission of carbon into the atmosphere. And that is the priority. Now, you can do it two ways. You can limit the emission of carbon or you can actually pull out the carbon from the atmosphere, which is one of the reasons why you've got technology such as carbon capture, uh, storage and sequestration, that is really, really a growth area for the industry today. Um, so when I asked the question, what is the energy transition? It was actually a little bit you know, uh, mischievous because the energy transition is multiple things. The energy transition is reduction of carbon intensive sources of energy, oil, gas, coal, yes, that reduction, reduction in our consumption and our demand and the individual carbon intensity of our individual lives, increase in more responsible, cleaner sources of energy. And because we already have a current footprint today, it's less coal, less oil, perhaps a little bit more gas as a transition fuel because we already have the infrastructure and the economies that we need to sustain and certainly an increase in uh, renewables, which by all accounts is going to grow uh, at an exponential rate in the coming years. Okay. So just, just one, one last point. The, the point I wanted to make was that the impact on the climate is really a function of the gigaton emissions of carbon, uh, of carbon into the atmosphere. And that's what we really need to prioritize this reduction. So, Coal, which is one of the dirtiest forms of uh, sources of energy today, really is should be on an accelerated downward trend. Gas, which is relatively cleaner, can be a transition fuel. And then investment into uh, renewables uh, on a wide scale should be encouraged. Okay. Uh, now, talking about transition fuel, you mentioned gas. Um, Eddie has asked the question, what is your view of gas as a transition fuel? Um, Gas is a transition fuel. It has the energy density. It is abundant. And perhaps the, the main answer, the main thing I would say, Eddie, to your question is that in the complex uh, narrative of energy markets and uh, sources of energy, there's one maxim that you can be sure that will always be true. And that is that the cheapest source of energy will always win the cheapest source of energy will always take the day. So if you tell a lady in Africa, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can, you know, see some faces if there's anyone. But, you know, if you tell the lady who walks five miles to fetch a bucket of water, you know, that she needs to use, you know, 
uh, a Tesla powered this and that, or a, a battery, she, you know, you can't even compute the economic impact of that to that particular person. So in places like Africa, there are um, numerous abundant sources of uh, hydrocarbons. There is the narrative or the argument that some parts of the world have not carbonized. So it's very difficult to tell them to decarbonize because um, carbon is in effect the currency of global development. Um, okay. uh, so to answer your question, uh, gas uh, as a transition fuel, I think is particularly attractive because it is less carbon intensive and burns cleaner than coal than oil because it doesn't have all the other residue and as such can allow energy poor communities access to a relatively cheap source of energy without making the kind of trade-off that would damage the planet. So again, it's a balance and there's lots of trade-offs uh, to be considered. Okay, we have a question from Oli. It says, the balance between poverty, environment and supply is felt most in Global South. If you could briefly present a blueprint for Africa achieving this balance, what would it be? And that's a very good question. Oli, that's a fantastic question. And, and I like the way you blow it up, you know, to the, on a continent wide. I spent uh, five years uh, working in Nigeria and I spent a significant amount of time speaking with, um, speaking and advocating for, I would say, responsible governance in the energy space. Uh, I'll just take Nigeria as an example, uh, because I think I am quite familiar with that environment. There's 40 billion barrels of crude uh, in Nigeria. Uh, that's 2P, i.e., uh, you know, with all the forms of uh, extraction, it's pretty certain we can have 40 billion barrels. And there's still lots more undiscovered. There's 200 trillion cubic feet of gas uh, in Nigeria that we should have access to. The rate at which we are um, producing both oil and gas, it would surprise all of you to know that Nigeria probably shouldn't be considered an oil producing country or an oil and gas producing country because the rate at which those reserves are being produced, they will only be depleted in more than a century. The average duration of depletion of reserves around the world is less than two decades. So the US, for example, currently has, I don't know, 80. Uh, billion barrels, they're producing six times or seven times Nigerian production. Angola, an African country, has a quarter of Nigerian reserves and is producing the same or very close to the same production. So the blueprint for Africa really is to take um, energy poverty head on. Um, in essence, Africa has not carbonized. Africa has not taken advantage of the um, numerous sources of energy to power industry, to build roads, to you know, build industries and has for the most part remained an exporter of primary ores and an exporter of primary goods that get processed outside the continent and then get re-imported. So there's very little value addition in the continent because you don't have power, for example, you don't have the good access to roads, you don't have railways and so on. So the blueprint really is for investment and uh, in my opinion, and I like this because this is the AFBE, um, the investment has to come from the continent. Um, the investment currently that occurs on the continent relies primarily on external sources of funding. And these external sources of funding are spoken for by different interests around the world. And it's fair because it's a global uh, landscape. You know, uh, countries make decisions based on their priorities. And nobody is going to think about Africa. Africa has to think for itself. So you've got access to funds, access to investment, use that investment and unlock the billions and the trillions of cubic feet of gas in the ground for the benefit of those, you know, starving populations and those individuals that do not have access to, to poverty. That is a fundamental issue. And addressing that issue does not mean that you deny the need for energy transition. It doesn't mean that we deny the need for more responsible. By the way, you know, if you look at the, the erosion of, the, um, sorry, the encroachment of the Sahara Desert coming down south, that is uh, a feature of climate change. 
if you look at the changing seasons, you know, when, when I was in school, we learned about the trade winds, you know, in July, you know, the winds go in one way and then you come later down, um, it goes in another way. I mean, these days, nobody can predict when is the August break for raid anymore, you know? I had August break, I've never, I've not seen that in a long time. So to answer your question, the blueprint is really in one word, investment. It's in another word, it's governance. You need good governance to manage that investment and get things right on the continent because it's going to be too late very soon. Thank you very much. We'll take one question um, and then we'll wrap up. This is quite interesting. I feel that we've not, um, I feel that there's, there's, there's still a few questions that need to be asked, but um, it's fine. Um, so um, a question here, recently due to, and this is from Abidemi, uh, due to energy poverty caused by high cost of gas and electricity supply, which we're suffering right now in, in, in certain parts of Europe, there is an upsurge in the use of biomass fuel for heating in the UK and other Western nations, especially during winter. And you know what? Winter is coming. Can we say biomass fuel is a renewable source? Um, so looking at the environmental impact and indoor air pollution from the smoke. Okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm here representing... Uh, myself primarily, and I'm not inventing the science. Um, biomass is only as renewable as it takes the renewal of wherever you got the fuel source from. So if you're, for example, using a natural source, you're chopping trees, for example, to be able to get your energy source, then it's not exactly very sustainable because you're going to you know, run through most of your sources of um, uh, of trees or, or wood uh, before you can basically use it again. Now, there are different sources, obviously. There's waste, there's waste as a source of energy, which is perhaps more renewable because you have a more frequent, you're not going to wait for a tree to grow before you chop it down. Mm -hmm. They're just going to chop through the forest, right? And, and that's not renewable. However, we generate a lot of waste and there's a lot of technology today that allows you to be able to use waste to uh, generate energy. And that in a sense is renewable. What is frankly very challenging and quite difficult for most of the people on this call is that, you know, it's been quite hard that in the face of energy security, it's not just biomass that has come back, it's coal. There are coal plants that are being fired up in certain parts of the world. I'm not gonna call anybody out, but they fired up these coal plants primarily because they've had to do a trade-off. Do we want people to freeze to death during winter or do we want to have access to, uh, to energy? And that is the reason why it's not one issue that we should be discussing. It's a balance and it's a trade-off. And particularly for those of us on the continent and those of us, you know, ethnic minorities and so on, we have people that are severely being impacted by these imbalances on the planet. And I think we need to, one, be informed about it, and we need to speak a lot clearer about the need for less, if you like, investment in things that do not matter, and more investment in actually realizing sustainability on the continent and in different parts of the world where energy uh, poverty is an issue. So, again, if there's anything I want to leave you all with is the transition is real. We need to be committed to decarbonizing. I currently work for a company that has staked its entire future on committing and contributing to a balanced planet. Mm. And we believe that so much, we've put the carbon budget curve into our, in our logo and our identity. So I'm very excited about that prospect. I'm very excited about what it means. But I also think that energy security and energy poverty are real issues that we have to address urgently. Thank you very much. Um, if I am, I'm going to put a request out because talking about uh, the energy future is an ongoing thing. And right now, because of the changes politically and otherwise, there's a lot of impact on our current energy situation. 
and its impending impact as well. You're on, being political, is that correct? <laughs> on, on, on poverty and, and, and energy supply and so many other issues. Um, and I think that um, it would be good if we did revisit this at some time in Q1 of next year. So let's give it about, you know, between now and about six months, or maybe Q1, Q2. And let us have a second session with you, revisiting, you know, looking at your slide, what the current situation is, and what we think is the impact going forward. What do you think? This is Roy. I'll be very pleased to come back to have a discussion at any time Beautiful. Uh, with, with you all. I um, actually feel perhaps we spent too much time talking about me maybe no 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 no, no, no we did talking about um the other issues very um, relevant i think that uh mobilizing people to be informed uh with the right data uh to to form an opinion i don't want everybody to take my opinion i think you need to form your opinion from the data and then to mobilize and advocate for change in society particularly with these issues uh, and the balance that uh, I'm advocating for, I think that that's very important. And if I can lend my voice once again to uh, expand this conversation, I, it will be my pleasure to do so. Thank you very much, Ifai, and thank you for committing online. Um, I would arrange the logistics with you for a follow-up talk. And please, I want you to know that the initial talk on knowing about you is very important. Um, it did set the scene, it did set the stage for your credibility in this particular talk, but it also helped us to know the man, if I not just the man behind the, the executive chair. It's always good to know the individual because that way it helps us to understand how we also can learn to navigate um, our careers and be great leaders as well. You've been on that journey, you're still on that journey, you're a leader in every right, and you're still on that trajectory. In fact, who knows who's going to be the, you know, the, 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 the boss very soon of SLB. Um, you know, so we're, maybe we're prophesying and speaking into your future. But ultimately, what we're trying to say is it's always good to know the man behind the mask. And, and that's what the initial session um, did. And now that we have started this conversation, which seems very exciting and, and it touches on certain points, there's certain things that it will be very good for us to focus on in the next session. And I, I certainly have people who um, have certain views that I would also like to speak on, which we didn't have time to bring them to speak on as well and ask them the questions that they want to ask. For example, talking about energy balancing or energy revolution and things like that. Um, so thank you very much, um, Ifai. It's a pleasure having you. This is one of the first times uh, in the history of this talk program that I have exceeded the six o'clock mark. So that tells you how important um, this particular conversation is. Um, so I would like to say thank you to everyone. But before we go, um, last night, AFBE launched the engineering sector's first ever ethnicity index. And you can see the logo right behind me. Um, this is a rating of where companies are on ethnic diversity. I'm pretty sure SLB will be at the top. Clearly, you can see that. It will also be a reflection of what engineers of color really think, how our voices can be heard. So to support this um, index, you can become a, a member of AFBE, but you can also check the website, the um, in EEI, which is the Engineering Ethnicity Index website, which I think my colleague Bumi should have put up already. It is very important that we all lend our voice to this particular cause, because this is the only way we can get diversity across um, organizations and have diversity in boardrooms and have diversity in actual organizations and having our voices being heard. You've heard Ifai today, brilliant. I can't say any more. So please, thank just you everyone. Kind, kind, right? Thank, thank you, you very much, much Ifai, for, for gracing us. And we will have a part two of this talk um, and it will be revisiting and carrying on from where we have stopped. So thank you to everyone who took time to join us this evening. It is a thank pleasure you. having you um, and have a lovely evening wherever you are.
Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.